Amen. All right, we're in Ephesians chapter 2 tonight. Ephesians chapter number 2. And we left off last time with verse number 5. And we'll just remind you about some things we said about that verse and then go uh, further. Ephesians chapter 5, uh, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace, ye are saved. And of course that comes on the heels of verse 4 where he says, But God who is rich in his mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins. And we pointed out the fact that it's truly amazing uh, that he loved us and loved us so much that he was willing to die for us, not uh, because we had cleaned up our act or we were doing better, but even in our sins. Uh, you think about this fact, we were, uh, we were as bad as bad can be when he saved us. We hadn't moved up any, we hadn't done better at all. We were literally dead in trespasses and sins and he died for us. And so we talked about some of that. Uh, he loved us, uh, it says in verse five, uh, sin, well in verse number four, his great love wherewith he loved us. And uh, not only did he love us, but he quickened us. He brought us, uh, he brought us to life, spiritual life, quickened us together with Christ by grace ye are saved and he ends the the um, verse with that and of course we're coming up to the most uh, famous verses probably in Ephesians certainly in Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 where he'll, he'll expand on that even more uh, but let's pick up in verse number 6 and so he's talking about all the things God has done for us and hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now we would be a fool to expect God to do all that he has done for us. But he has done even more. Again, we've already seen, if we look further back, that Jesus sits on high over all of creation, over all of his enemies. But Paul says that the Father has raised us up not just out of the grave, uh, but above this earthly existence to sit together in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Of course, this doesn't mean that we have the same power and authority that he has, but we get to sit with him. We are identified with him. Again, just get this thought in your mind. Remember, we talked about walking down the road, seeing that old dead dog on the side of the road. <laughs> That's a terrible thought. We don't want to even think about that. But we were dead in trespasses and sins. And, uh, you know, old dead dog, we might just want to get him out of the way so nobody's got to look at him. But God loved us so much. He sent his son. He died for us. He saved us. He quickened us. And he has raised us up to sit with him in heavenly places. Oh, he's done far more than we could ever uh, have imagined or we could ever expect. And why has he done this? Look at verse number 7. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Uh, now think of this. His creation, the creation, shows the riches of his power and of his wisdom. And you know, the more we study the cosmos or chemistry or biology, any of the sciences the more we see just how great his, his wisdom and his power is. I mean, it's amazing. I, I think I mentioned before in another passage, but you know, if we take something that man has made, maybe a carpenter went and built something and uh, it looks really good, but you put it under a microscope and you start zooming in and you start seeing it's not quite as nice as it looked. You know, the tighter you get, the rougher it looks and everything. But you go and take a flower and you put it under the microscope and the deeper you get, the more amazing it looks. <laughs> And if you could get down into the molecules and see the electrons and all that, it just gets more and more amazing. And if we turn the telescope to the heavens, you know, we look out and we're amazed. It's always been interesting to me. I've, I've always loved uh, going camping or somewhere getting where there's not very much uh, light pollution, they call it, where you got a dark sky. And lay there and just stare at the sky. And the longer you stare, the more stars you'll see. And you can see so many that you're just, you know, shocked at how many there are. But if you were to take that telescope and turn and start going out, the further you zoom, the more you see and the more amazing it becomes. You know, God's creation, it, it never uh, ceases to amaze. That shows the power, the creation shows the power of his and the riches of his power and of his wisdom. But he displays the riches of his grace by his plan of redemption. 
Think of that. That's what he says in verse number 7. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. You know, one of the arguments that people make when you say, uh, well, I, we, don't believe in, um, we don't believe in aliens. And somebody says, uh, well, you know, if, if that's true, that sure is a waste of space. Think of all that space out there. You know, when I think of the, the vast reaches of space, I don't think, boy, what a waste of space. I think, boy, what the grace of God that he would, number one, create all of this for his glory. But then this one planet right here in, this, in the Milky Way galaxy down here, this one planet that has people on it, that he would create an entire plan of redemption for us here on this planet. And you compare that, again, as I said the other day, for him to create the universe, all he had to do was speak. But for us to be saved, he had to die. Think of that. Just totally amazing, this, this plan of salvation. And then, of course, we come to the very familiar verses, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Now notice, we have that word for there. So that connects verse 8 back to verse 7. He says, for by grace. So he's talking about grace that he mentioned in verse 7. So what does he say again in verse 7? That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved. He says, hey, uh, the fact that he has saved us Throughout all of eternity, we will be trophies of grace. Just think of that. God will not point to, hey, you know, look at all the cosmos and uh, look at the angels and look at the beasts of Revelation and look at all these things and all the kingdoms of the earth and all that to, to ultimately get glory for what he's done. He'll point to us. Say, look what I've done in them. We are the, we are the masterpieces of his grace. And it's not because we deserve it, it's just the opposite, because we don't deserve it, <laughs> that it's so amazing. And so in verse 8 he says, for by grace are ye saved. That is that powerful uh, thing by which we are saved. We're going to expand on that thought, but just get that in your mind at first. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now Paul has just said this, but he expands on it. We are saved by grace through faith. That's a simple formula. Grace is God's part. Faith is our part. Now that doesn't mean we're doing anything. In faith, all we're doing is believing in what's already been done. Uh, but we must exercise that faith. Uh, there are some who say uh, man cannot do anything on his part to be saved. And we can't do anything as far as works, but we do have a part to play, and that's to believe what he has done. If we refuse to do that, we will not be saved, even though salvation is made available. He says, for by grace are ye saved through faith. It's not God's faith, it's our faith, placing faith in what he has done for us. And I'm going to expand on, on this in just a moment. But he says, it is not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. So some have, have looked at this verse and they have questioned, what is the gift? You see the end of the verse there? And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. What's he talking about? Some would say, well, he's talking about grace. Grace is not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Some would say he's talking about faith. Uh, faith is not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. But I don't believe either one of those answers the question correctly. The gift is salvation. That's what he's talking about. He says, for by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And one reason I think that is because as we follow down to verse number 9, he says, not of works, lest any man should boast. If he were saying that grace is the gift, why would Paul say not of works? Is there, would anybody think we can work to build up, to work up grace? No, grace is something God does. And what about faith? Is it a work to, to build up our faith? No, the Holy Spirit creates faith in us and helps us with that faith. That, that's not it. So if, if verse number 9 says whatever this gift is, is something that you would not think, you, you might think of it as works, but it's not. It can't be grace. It can't be faith. It can only be the gift, which is salvation. And so that is the gift. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. You know, there will not be a single person in heaven who could boast of getting there on their own. That would be a source of pride. You remember what happened the last time pride was in heaven? 
Lucifer lifted himself up. He said, I will be like the Most High. And what happened? He and a third of the angels were cast out of heaven. That'll never happen again. By the way, have you ever thought that maybe your mind's never gone this way, but have you ever thought to yourself, well, you know, after the tribulation, millennial period, and then eternity begins, and we'll be in heaven, and, and what, 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 about, what would happen if maybe a million years from now the angels decided we're going to rebel again and, and start all this over again? I know that's not going to happen. Why? Because the Bible says that we'll be there forever, eternity. It doesn't say anything about that. God knows what's going to happen. And it can't happen. Uh, that's been taken care of. But pride is what led to all that. And there'll be no pride in heaven. And so for anyone to think that they'll be able to stand and boast uh, before God, uh, we won't be able to do that. And it's because salvation is by grace through faith. Now we're down in verse number 10. We see this word for again. It connects what Paul is about to say to what he's just said in verses 8 and 9. He said that our salvation is by grace through faith, that it's not of ourselves, it is a gift of God. Now look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Hey, if there's any works involved in salvation, it's all on God's part. He did all the work. He said, you have no work to do. You are his workmanship. Uh, he's the one that's working in you. Uh, not only are we not able to earn salvation by our works, but whatever, work, but whatever we become is by his works. He's the one that's doing that. We're his workmanship. It's from the word poema, and it literally means a product or a thing that is made. So again, we are his workmanship. We're his masterpiece. He is creating us. Not because we're so wonderful. Remember, we were dead in trespasses and sins when he found us. But because of what he has been able to make us into. And then he says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So the product that he is making out of us is created in Christ Jesus. It is only because of what Jesus has done for us that the Father is able to do anything with us. <laughs> you ever think about that? Somebody's, you know, out there living on, you know, living for the devil and doing all these things, and uh, God has never come to anyone, seen them, you know, living a wicked life down in the gutters, and gone down and re reached down, picked them up, and, and taken care of them and got outside of Christ. It always begins with Christ. They have to come to the Father through Christ, always. And that's what he says in verse 10, created in Christ Jesus. It's always in uh, Christ Jesus. He's working in our lives. And what is he doing it for? Unto good works. In other words, he is making us into the people that we are able to be to do what we ought to do. He is working that in us. You know, we could not do right before we were saved. We were dead in our sins. We walked according to the course of this world and lived by the lust of the flesh. But now we can do good works and he desires that we do. And that's what he's working in our life. And then again in verse number 10 at the end he says, Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. He ordained before we were even saved that once we were saved, we should, work, we should walk in good works. Now get this, good works, of course, is not the price of salvation, they are the product of salvation. Good works are not the price of salvation, they're the products of salvation. We don't do right in order to get saved, we do right because we are saved and because the Holy Spirit is doing a work within us. It is the outgrowth, it's the product of our salvation. Once we're saved, we're able to walk in good works. Now some act as if being saved has nothing to do with the way they live. And someone claims to be a Christian, but they still live like the world. And if you dare to ask them about it, they quickly accuse you of being a legalist. Well, how dare you? Don't you, uh, don't you dare judge me or whatever. But we take the Word of God, and it clearly says that there's going to be a difference. You're a new creation. You're a new creature in Christ. And, and good works ought to show. That doesn't mean you're going to be perfect, and it's not going to always happen right away and all that kind of thing. But, boy, there ought to be a change. And if there's no change on the outside, there's probably not been a change on the inside. And the Bible says, by their fruits you shall know them. Now he was talking about false teachers, but that's applicable to others as well that claim that they're saved. Verse number 11 says, Wherefore remember 
that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision, in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So in verse 11, Paul is reminding the Gentiles in the church at Ephesus, which was probably most of them, you know, in Ephesus, there were probably mostly Gentiles there, uh, that before they were saved, the Jews made a distinction between them and the Gentiles. Uh, they looked down on the Gentiles because they were not Jews. They were not the circumcision. But notice that he says that they were Gentiles in the flesh. In other words, that they who, who they naturally were. He's saying in their flesh, that's who they naturally were. But notice what he also says again in verse number 11 at the end. He says, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. He points out that both uncircumcision and circumcision are in the flesh. Remember how we talked a while back about walking in the spirit as opposed to walking in the flesh and saying that walking in the flesh is not necessarily living a wicked life. It can also be trying to live a righteous life on your own. Both of those are in the flesh. So the uncircumcision, they may be worshiping many gods and pagan and everything else, and they're in the flesh. But the Jew, they may have circumcision. They may have done what uh, you know, God told Abraham and passed on down. This is the sign of the Jew. They may have done all that, but they're still in the flesh because they're trusting in that. Both are wrong. And Paul's going to expand on this. But I think it's interesting that he mentions and calls both of them uh, in the flesh as well. Now look at verse number 12 again. That at that time ye were without Christ. At the beginning of verse 11, Wherefore remember that ye being times past were Gentiles in the flesh by the uncircumcision. It's called the circumcision made by the hands. That at that time. So this is something else he's reminding them of. He says, wherefore remember, number one, that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh. Number two, that at that time you were without Christ. He says, remember, back at that time, before you were saved, you were in the flesh and you were without Christ. And he says, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So he continues to contrast the natural state of the Gentile with that of the Jew. Before the gospel came to the Gentile world, the only way they could know anything about God was to go to a Jew. You think about this. Remember, God creates the universe. He gives Adam his, you know, what he expects him to do. One rule there in the garden. But remember, he walked with him and talked with him. And so he gives that to Adam and Eve. They sin, they go out of the garden, but they are to pass that on to their children. Cain and Abel and Seth and so on and so forth. They're to pass that along. And then we come to Noah. Noah and his family are the only ones who survive. They come off the ark. Noah is to pass on to Ham, Shem, and Japheth what God has said. And it's, it's being passed on father to son, father to son, on down the line. And then all of a sudden, out of all the humanity on earth, God points down to Abraham and Ur of the Chaldees. And he says, you, I'm going to make a nation out of you. And he takes him out and he begins to give him the covenants and begins to expand on what he expects of man. He passes down to Isaac, passes it down to Jacob. He passes it to his children. 400 years later, God again points down to Moses. You go and lead my children out. He leads them out. They get in the desert and what happens? Moses either sits down and writes Genesis or compiles together what has been written and he writes Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. Now we have codified what God expects. But where is it? It's with Moses and the children of Israel. It's with one group, maybe six million people, but that's a small group compared to everybody on earth. And they go into the promised land. They set up their, their nation eventually, have judges and then prophets and priests and kings. And they are to pass that on to their people. Now anybody anywhere on earth could be saved at any time. But to understand what God wants, it's, it's included with this small group here. And they take that. And by the way, they were supposed to be an example to the world. They were supposed to help pass that along. Of course, they were disobedient to God as well. 
And then, of course, you know the divided kingdom. The northern kingdom goes to Assyria. They're scattered all over the place. Southern kingdom, Judah, uh, goes to Babylon. Seventy years later, they come back. They rebuild the temple. They rebuild the wall. And they rebuild their religion. And by the time they come back, one, thing that, one good thing that had happened in Babylon is that idol worship was completely burned out of them. They didn't want anything to do with idol worship anymore. And they come back and they say, hey, we really want to worship God like we should. And that's a good thing. But then the curtain of time is closed and 400 years later it's opened back up and we have the oral law and we have Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes and rabbis and all of a sudden they've taken God's simple law and they've added so much to it and now all they care about is all, all the outward things that we're doing. And John the Baptist comes along and he gets on them. He says, y'all, you're all wicked and the Lord comes and you've heard it's been said but I say unto you and and so he gives the gospel, he dies, buried, resurrected, 40 days later he ascends, and then what happens? The church goes out and the Holy Spirit inspires them to write the word of God, write the gospels down. James probably writes the first one, Mark might have written the second one, Matthew and Luke and the, the uh, Pauline epistles and the general epistles are all coming. Then towards the end of the first century, John writes his gospel, he writes his three epistles, he writes the revelation, and then closed. The canon of scripture is done. God's given us everything he wants us to know. It's all contained within the word of God. Now look again at verse number 12. That at that time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. So from the time that God has begun to really explain what he wants it's been to one group this whole time. The Jews. And we get into the New Testament and what happens? At Pentecost Peter gets up and preaches and boy, people from all over the place are hearing the gospel. And they go back home and they start telling the gospel. Great persecution comes and the Jewish Christians scatter all over the place. And everywhere they go, they're preaching and telling the gospel and churches are getting started. And it's going all over the place. Before that, before Gentiles heard the gospel, for all of those years... They were far away from Christ. They were aliens. They were aliens from the commonwealth and from the covenants. They didn't know any of this. He reminds them, at that time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of the promise. You remember when they came out of Egypt, there were strangers with them. And they would call them strangers in the gate. And they might have been with them and going with them, but they were never going to be a full-fledged member of the family of Israel. And he says, uh, Gentiles, that's the way you were. You know, a Gentile could have gone and become a proselyte to Judaism. There were ones like that. They called them God worshipers and people that were Gentiles that came and said, hey, I like this Judaism idea. Now think about this. Up until this point, Judaism is basically the only religion that is monotheistic. Everybody else is worshiping everything under the sun, including the sun. The Egypt, Egyptians are worshiping alligators and birds and crocodiles and everything. And the, you know, the, the Greeks, they've got a pantheon of gods up there. And you know, there's just all this. And of course, they're wicked and they're vile. And, and what their God, quote unquote, requires of them is horrible. Well, I can imagine that some of them would see this. these Jews come with this monotheistic religion that has a God that loves them and you know, appreciate that. But by the time that this is spreading around, the Jews are so uh, proud of themselves uh, that they look down on everybody else that's not like them. And all of the rights, whether it's the, uh, the food they can eat or not eat or circumcision or whatever, uh, they're uh, you know, appalled by all of that. And so he says they were, um, they were aliens to the commonwealth. The commonwealth, by the way, means the body politic. In other words, you couldn't be a citizen of the family of God by the way the Jews think of it and of the covenants of promise who are the covenants given to Abraham Isaac Jacob Moses and David you weren't part of that Gentiles having no hope and without God in the world boy can you imagine if we still didn't have the word of God aren't you glad we've got the Bible we have hope here's verse 13 though here's here's one of those hinges that I said Great things swing on in the word of God. But, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. But, that changes everything. 
Think about the story of the prodigal son. You know, the truth of that story is, of course, as we've said before, the Lord is the main character in every story. The Father represents our Heavenly Father. He's the main character. That's what it's about. But what you need to understand to truly understand that story is that both boys were lost. The Father is our Heavenly Father, our Creator. And in that way, we are all His children because He's created all of us, but we're not really born into His family when we're born. And the younger son, he takes off to a far country and he wastes all his living with riotous living. He is far away. Those are the Gentiles. We are far away. But the older son, he's right there at the house. And he's working hard. And everything from the outside looks like, boy, he's a good boy. He's a good son. But by the end of the story, we find out both of them were lost. Neither of them were true sons of the father. Finally, at the end, the younger brother, he comes to himself. Just like when the Holy Spirit of God brings conviction in our heart. And what happens, the Bible says that when the father saw him a long way off, a great way off, he ran to him and he fell on his neck and he kissed him and he put the ring on his finger. And he came in and now he is truly a son of the father. But the final scene is the older brother representing the Jews who have still at that point rejected Christ. He's still not part of the family. He's been there the whole time and he says, hey, I've given you everything. God gave the Jews every opportunity, every covenant, gave them his law, everything. But they, in their heart, they were never truly part of the family. And so just like that prodigal son who was far off and now is made nigh, now he's truly a part of the family. He's saying, Gentiles, you were once far away from God, but now through the blood of Christ, you are made nigh. You are, you are truly a part of the family. And it's always by the blood of Christ. Verse 14 says, For he is our peace. You notice how many times we read in the Bible about Christ. It doesn't say, For he does this or what he is this. What did he say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he said, I am Alpha and Omega. He said, I am over and over again. And here we see, For he is our peace. Not just that he brings peace, he is our peace. There would be no peace without his death but notice what he says for he is our peace who hath made both who's he been talking about Jews and Gentiles one we are one now think I don't know how many times you've, you've met a Jew a, a real serious Jew you know that that knew about their heritage and that kind of thing uh, there, there was one there's a lady that taught at Grace uh, Christian School and her father was a Jew he was saved though but he was a Jew was, was he saved or was he not can you remember he wasn't at first. Did he get saved late? And mom would, uh, every, whenever there was like a Jewish holiday come up, she would find a card for that, Hanukkah or whatever, and send that to him. And I think she put a track in it or something like that. She would do something to try and, and uh, but I think he did eventually get saved. But you know, we, we look at Jews, as Christian Gentiles, we might look at Jews, and even if they're saved, still think, well, I don't know, there's still something a little different, you know, us and them. No, we are one one in Christ. That's what he says. Made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Uh, that phrase there is not used uh, flippantly as anything else in the word of God is not. When you came to the temple you had the courts out there and the first court that you would come to was the court of the Gentiles. That's where Gentiles could come. Then there was a partition and it was called the middle wall of partition. And that wall, there was a sign over it that said any Gentile crossing this wall here is in danger of death. You could be killed if you come in here. Because that wall, you entered into what was called the court of the women. And that's where Jews could come. Of course, beyond that, there was a wall. Only Jewish women, men and women could go there. Beyond that was the court of the men. Only Jewish men could go. And then beyond that was the temple proper where you went in and the priests were doing the sacrifices and all. Now that court of uh, the Gentiles out there the Jews and Gentiles could mingle and all that but when you got to that wall only Jews could pass through there and if you remember when Paul at the end of his third missionary journey he comes back to Jerusalem and he goes to James and says hey look what we've done for the Lord all these people are saved and they're like oh that's great here's what we need you to do they don't, they don't really listen to him too much and they say we got a couple of guys here that have had a, uh, uh, something they've done that, and they're done with it we need you to help them with this uh, 
and they, they can't pay for it. They're, they're done with this vow that they've had and uh, they want you to be at charges and that meant they were asking Paul to pay the fee for these men and it was very expensive. But Paul was willing to do it to show that he was not completely turning his back on his Jewish brethren. He was willing to do that. And so he goes into the temple with them. And they would, have, they would cut their hair and burn their hair. It was all kind of thing. But while they were in there, somebody claimed that Paul had brought a Greek into the temple. Had brought them past that middle wall of partition. And they nearly tore him apart because of that. Now he didn't. He would never have done that. He didn't do that. And he eventually escaped their hands. And from that he eventually ends up going to Rome. But what he's talking about is that wall. That middle wall of partition. Now that wall stood until 70 AD. When Titus and the Romans came in. And tore down the, the temple completely. But Paul says that symbolically. The Lord knocked that wall down. When he died on the cross. There is now no division between us and the Jews. We are one in Christ. That's what he's talking about there. In verse 15 he says, Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Now notice he has abolished the enmity. There was enmity between Jews and Gentiles. Jews looked at Gentiles and said, hey, you're not, you're not good enough for us. And you remember the Samaritans. They looked down on the Jews. There have been centuries of hate between them two. But in Christ, that enmity has been demolished. It is gone. And he says, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make himself of twain one new man, so making peace. The law of commandments contained in ordinances was what kept the Jews and the Gentiles apart. But listen to this. It was really even what kept Jews and God apart. The Jews would look at the law and they would say, hey, this is our law. This is what makes us part of God's family. And Gentiles, you're not part of it. You don't follow the law. So you... But God looked down and he said, that law don't make you part of my family. As a matter of fact, that law does just the opposite. It shows you why you can't be part of my family on your own. You've missed it, Jews. I didn't give you this as a ladder to climb to heaven. It's a wall to show you can't get up here. But they were so prideful in that. They looked at the laws and ordinances and commandments and they said, this is what makes us special, Gentiles, for to make in himself, in himself of twain, one new man. It is in Christ. And so, making peace. Now, of course, he's been talking about the peace, the enmity between Jews and Gentiles, and he says there's peace. But the far greater peace than the peace between Jews and Gentiles is the peace between man and God. That's the peace that was made on the cross of Calvary. Now I want you to think of something. Whatever you've got with somebody else, whatever problem you've got with somebody else, think of the Jews and Gentiles. However big that is, however big a problem that is, however much you think they've done you wrong and you just can't get over it, it is nothing compared to the enmity between you and God. And God made peace between himself and you in Christ. If that's the case, then there should be nothing that we should have against our brother and sister in Christ. We ought to say, hey, listen, we, I had this problem with you, you had this with me, but God had a far greater problem with me. And he has made peace with me, he's made peace with you, we are together in Christ. Let's bury all of that. It's just an amazing thought of himself of twain one new man so making peace in verse 16 and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross having slain the enmity thereby think of that imagery and that he might reconcile both notice he doesn't say reconcile both unto each other both unto God you see, if you and I have a problem with one another and we make up on this one issue here and we continue on down the road, we may have another problem and we may have to do it. But if you and I have been both reconciled to God, now we're children of God together. We say, listen, whatever we've got between each other, God has forgiven me far more than I could ever have to worry about forgiving you. Let's work this out together. Beautiful language. And he says, in one body, by the way, what, what body is that? the body of Christ that's the church we are one in the church 
And he says, having slain the enmity. He didn't just put it down. It's slain. It's killed. It's dead. There is therefore now no condemnation of them which are in Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. That enmity between God and us is slain. It's done. Isn't that great? God never comes back and says, oh, well, yeah, well, you remember what you did before. and you No, nope, it's done. It's over with. It's been slain. And came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh. Hey, the gospel's for everybody. Amen. <laughs> preached it to them that were far off and those that were nigh. Listen to Romans 3, verses 20 through 23 with, these, with this in, in mind. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So Jews, you're counting on the law and all that you can do. No, there, there's, what does he say? He says, uh, there's no flesh justified in his sight in the law. Then he says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. That's important. In other words, this was not, you know, a lot of the... Uh, Prophet, well, none of the prophet, the Old Testament prophets understood about the church age and the gospel and how that it would be open to the Gentiles. That was a mystery to them. But that doesn't mean it wasn't there. We can look back and see the gospel over and over again in the law and the prophets in the Old Testament. And so he says it was witnessed by the law and the prophets. And so what is this? Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, not by works, not by the law, but by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We are all under the same condemnation and so we can all only be saved the same way. It's not that, well, Jews, you get saved by the law. Now, Gentiles, you have to have faith in Christ. No, the Jews were going to have to have faith in Christ too. Everybody was. In verse 18, he says, For... Through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Notice that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have separate but equal parts in our access to the Father. We are able to come before the throne of grace in prayer today and in actuality one day by the Spirit through the Son. Now verse number 19, he says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Remember all the way back in the previous verses he said you were far off, you were aliens, you were strangers, you're not part of the commonwealth, you're not part of the covenants, uh, you, you were away from the Jews, the Jews looked down on you. And then he goes through all this telling us what Christ has done and in the end he says now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints, now notice, and of the household of Israel, no of God. We didn't trust Christ and now we're a Jew. <laughs> no, the Jews and the Gentiles have trusted Christ and now we're in the family of God. We're reconciled together unto God. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Of course, Christ is the chief cornerstone. Uh, that cornerstone is the one that is true and perfect and every other block must come off of that exactly right. The apostles and prophets, they were able to help lay that foundation in the teaching and preaching and writing of the word of God. But that foundation has now been laid and we build upon that foundation. We are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly formed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. He said, I will build my church. He's going to build the church, but it is fitly formed together in Christ. And if we ever, you know, that cornerstone, those two sides, those perfect angles out there, we ever get off of that, we're off of the building plan, and we're not in the building that he's building. We have to stay right with the plans. In whom all the building, verse 21, fitly framed together, groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. And then finally, verse 22, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Hey, he's not only building the church, he's building you, church. You are, he's working on you as well. We are the church. It's not just the church writ big, it's each and every one of us. It's a personal thing. And so we see that Paul has taught them, 
he showed them that Jews and Gentiles alike both needed the same thing, faith in Christ. And in Christ we are brought together and made in one. Amen. Father, I thank you so much for this truth. Lord, this is something that man never would have conceived of. Even the prophets didn't understand this. But you had planned this plan of, of the gospel in, in ages before eternity. You knew exactly what you were going to do. And Lord, we thank you for your word that shows us this so clearly. And we thank you that we are able to be a part of your true family, the Israel of God, truly part of your family through the blood of Christ. Lord, we have brothers and sisters in Christ all around the world in, uh, with the Jews and, and other Gentiles everywhere. And Lord, one day we look forward to getting to meet all of them together. But we thank you that we are one in Christ. And Lord, I pray that we would remember that as we go throughout and meet up with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, let us not ever have anything between us, Lord, without realizing and recognizing that you have forgiven us far more than we would ever have to forgive anyone else. And Lord, that we would strive for unity together and serve you together. We thank you again for the opportunity to be here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.